Okay. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining. My name is Tony Bacigalupo. I'm with New Work Cities, uh, and today I'm going to be uh, doing kind of a live coaching interview thing uh, with my new friend Brandon Napoli. Uh, Brandon, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you're working on, and uh, kind of what's on your mind right now? Great. Thanks, Tony, for having me. Um, yeah, so my focus uh, is to create a co working space here in Palo Alto. Um, and actually uniquely positioned in a church here in Palo Alto called Crossroads. Um, and before I get into that, uh, my background really quickly, for the last 10 years, I've been serving entrepreneurs, um, typically underserved entrepreneurs in low to moderate income areas um, through micro lending and then other type of uh, educational and seminars um, throughout the United States, Los Angeles, San Diego, New York, and then San Francisco. Um, and then recently, uh, took the dive into trying to create my own startup in the co-working space. Um, and so here I am, um, mainly still in the conceptual phase, but uh, about to hit, have the tires hit the road very soon um, and beta testing the space. Uh, we have, we actually just got all the, most of the, all the furniture. Um, and so we're going to start painting and uh, redoing some of the, the, the flooring. Um, but before we get too much in the operations, um, I really want to make sure that we just, uh, focus on, on the community and the culture of the space um, to make sure that it, it was fitting for uh, adding value uh, to the community and, and doing it something um, that's not being provided right now. That's great, Brandon. I love it. Um, I'm really curious sort of how you ended up deciding to make that leap. I think it's a big decision when you're going to go from kind of looking at this world and being interested in it to um, I'm going to actually commit to a, a space and a specific space, and it's a big, uh, a big commitment. So, what, um, what kind of motivated you to make that leap? <laughs> uh, well, to be honest, I think it, it took uh, several small leaps, um, and I think it, it, a matter of just, um, I, I can't give myself that much credit to think that I, I made a, a, a huge leap. Um, although I did drive from Brooklyn out to San Francisco, it was, it was originally work related with my employer. And when I got here, I, I just, um, I felt like, uh, maybe this is the coming of age being in your thirties as some, but you, you start to put your passion a little bit ahead of things in a way that's, um, more prudent. And for me, my passion has been, uh, serving underserved entrepreneurs, um, you know, helping people uh, just um, to be empowered. And then at the same time, I'm, I'm a person of faith and I wanted to uh, help the church to just be more relevant. Um, and so I saw like a, a unique opportunity of, of pairing the two. Um, as most people know, churches typically just operate on Sunday mornings, fairly underused asset. Um, and I, I wanted to see if there's a way to just um, you know, open the doors and, and see what happened. Uh, being in Palo Alto is a no-brainer. It's, it's the hub of innovation. It's a hub of entrepreneurship. Um, and so, you know, you look at the community that the church is supposed to serve and you say, how can we do this? And, and the first, honestly, thing that came up to mind was, well, let's give them a place that they want to be in Monday through Friday without, you know, getting uh, preached to. Um, and so that's when I started kind of developing more of understanding of, of the co-working space and new of social impact hub from some of my previous uh, contacts. And, um, and so then I looked into it from that point. So you know, what you're doing is interesting and for, for many reasons, but you know, just building a co-working space has a pretty big impact on a, a community already. Uh, but you're not only aiming to do that, you're also aiming to kind of uh, challenge what it is to uh, participate in a church community. Uh, you know, creating this kind of different way of looking at uh, using that church space and maybe even inviting people to participate in a way that, um, you know, as you said, doesn't preach, doesn't actually uh, impose any of the traditional religious um, structures on it, but it just kind of creates an invitation for people to have a new way of kind of getting, getting involved and just getting in the door. Uh, and so it sounds like it sounds like you're trying to do something that's going to achieve a lot of good in a lot of different ways. Uh, if, if you can get it all to kind of hang together. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, wanting to try to please, you know, the different unique stakeholders, uh, 
that are present, you know, the, the one obviously being in the church and educate them on the, on the, the fact that, you know, with common value set that we can share with our neighbors, um, you know, that if, if we can at least agree upon that place, um, if the church can be a place of inspiration, um, you know, a place that people prefer to come to versus sit in a cubicle um, that makes them, you know, uh, incorporate, uh, you know, uh, creativity in their work and, and be a part of, uh, not be as lonely or not be as, um, you know, in a, in a, a place of, um, uh, of negative emotions and, and, you know, kind of finding that common ground. Um, you know, that, that's, the, that's the type of community I think that both parties would like to be a part of. Yeah, well, that's the that's certainly something that I'm, I'm very curious to see how it's going to play out for you over the next several months, especially in these early stages when you're kind of pitching the idea and people are still kind of getting the hang of it. Um, hmm. So before we got on the call, you had told me uh, a couple of things that are on your mind that uh, you wanted to cover on this conversation around uh, community and culture building leading up to the opening of the space. And then... Um, technology platforms and if we have time i'd love to hit both uh can you tell us a little bit about those questions and why they're alive for you right now sure so um yeah i think it goes back to uh the value proposition with both stakeholders the uh, the, the, the neighbors and the church itself um you know one, one of the things i see as a, a necessary ingredient is speaking into the type of culture that we're trying to create um, speaking into the type of community that we're trying to provide uh, that's necessary for I know um, the pastoral staff to sign off on something that it's not just haphazardly done that it's that you know there's not a feeling of a lack of control or a large amount of uncertainty of of, of even um, just opening doors and see what happens you know that's that's uh, that's a lot of change. And so there's a, I think there's a change management component in creating community um, that's not spoken of as, as much um, and, and just want to, you know, really be much more intentional. At some point, we'd love to get to the place where we're like, well, let's just organically see what happens. Uh, but I think it, it helps to settle some nerves to say, well, this is how you can build community in a positive way. It's seen elsewhere, some best practices. Um, and let's sign off on just like that intentionality um, to get to second base. And then when we get to second base, let's just open it up to just a little bit more of, uh, let's just kind of see what happens once we know our neighbors and realize what their needs are and, and go from there. Yeah. So to some degree, because of the stakeholders involved, you have to be able to settle on a certain degree of uh, this is the vision for the project. These are kind of the constraints around it. Uh, I imagine the folks that you're working with are progressive for the, their world, uh, but maybe also still have to deal with the constraints of being a religious institution that have uh, legal and ethical and, and religious requirements for, for what it is that, they, that they're doing. So you have to kind of take that into account before you can even really get a, a seat at the table. Is that kind of, the, is that kind of right? Yeah, that, that's correct. And, and just to give an extreme example, you know, it, you know, to have the option of, of, of having like adult entertainment come into the church, that's, that can create the kind of community the church would be open to trying to influencing, right? Uh, so there, there's some things that are, that are obviously, you know, clearly understood, but I, I think there's a bigger play here, which is to really convince churches at large that um, creating community through a workspace is something that um, they would want to participate in that actually carries out their mission better, I would even argue, than just a Sunday morning service. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I think there's a, huge, a big play, but it starts with just getting on base, you know, just taking a swing at the bat and, and being intentional about, um, you know, the, some of the techniques of, of hitting the ball or creating that community and culture. Yeah, so in, in your particular case, because of the nature of the project, you've already had to do a very important initial step, which is get some of the core stakeholders involved and get them in the conversation, figure out what their needs are, uh, and then incorporate that into the ultimate plan so that um, what you're doing will be able to progress past that stage. Uh, mm -hmm. And then once you've got that in place, you're saying, now you've got, you know, I'm, I'm guessing you're kind of, 
either past the stage or you're mostly past the stage, you're kind of looking at the next stage. And in that next stage is when you're maybe going to end up uh, starting to engage more with, with public, uh, with members, with prospective members, things like that. And that's when you're going to be able to kind of identify where there are some opportunities to refine the model and, and get a better sense of how it's all actually going to work. That's, that's exactly correct. Great. Well, you're off to a good start then. <laughs> um, you know, so many people in a traditional co-working environment, uh, so many people um, build in secret and, you know, don't really talk to people or involve people in the process until after the doors are open, uh, which is a, just an enormous mistake uh, because then the problem is once the doors are open, if you haven't involved people in the process, then they don't really care. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, all you're really asking people to do is to consume uh, a service that you're offering them and people don't really respond well to that. And so uh, mm-hmm. what you're doing, at least in these early stages, you know, is getting some of those core people involved, getting their buy-in. So that's giving you kind of the starting point. Now what I think we want to do as we're talking about, you know, the next step is how do we approach the, the people, the people who are actually going to be prospective members of this space uh, and get them involved in this conversation about this kind of radical new idea of, you know, could we, what does it look like to co-work in a church? You know, what are all mm-hmm. kinds of the, the juicy questions that come up and things that are exciting about that, things that people are concerned about and just stir that stuff up. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. Um, that's exactly, I think, where the conversation is at this point. Uh, to open it up to you know the, the neighbors and, and to see how they would pour into it, um, I, I think there's to be honest and, and there's a little bit of a, a, like being afraid of seeing what people will say. Um, you know, there's a, a church is not a a politic place. You know, like a lot of people have you know negative feelings towards it, and that's great to you know listen in on you know what they have to say. Um, but I think having gain, gaining the gumption of and of, of just going out there and, and listening and saying what would make this place um, useful for you, right? Um, let's not talk about price. Let's just talk about if if you had the ability to work and it's just down the street, what would actually draw you into this space? Um, so I, I, I like to continue to develop out those questions to be ones that would. Um, really, you know, be able to aggregate into something that would, again, um, not just be like a yes or no answer, but just allow us to continue to creatively um, construct values over, construct, you know, requirements and expectations over. Um, and, 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 and then maybe start as a soft landing pad just to, you know, be what I hope the church would be, which is a place of dialogue, right, um, of differences that are celebrated, not discouraged. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that, that I think takes a level of expertise that I'd be looking, looking elsewhere to just help to help me facilitate. Um, it's one thing to kind of conceptually understand. It's another thing to execute on that. Um, and so that, that's kind of where I'm at at this point too. Yeah. Well, it sounds like, I mean, first of all, I just want to kind of reflect what you said and, and say that I think that it's, it's smart to call out the fact that this is an unusual thing. It is an unproven thing. It's something that's going to stir up some feelings and some questions, some concerns, things like that. Uh, and that that dialogue may be something that's going to just be a part of the project all the way through for, for as many years as it runs, um, because this is the kind of thing that uh, we want to be challenging. And that's something that's going to take some time for people to get the hang of. You know, what does it mean for people to have a different kind of a relationship with the church than what we've been raised to believe is kind of our standard relationship that, that we think of it as uh, for the last several generations. Uh, and so the fact that you're kind of incorporating that into the plan, uh, I think, is, is going to be necessary just because it's going to be such a big part of the story from the very beginning. And, you know, I could see somebody in a, in a different mindset wanting to avoid that conversation, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and just kind of pretend like everything's normal. But it sounds a bit like based on what you're saying that you want to be able to say, hey, this is not normal. And that's the point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and whatever mm-hmm. that brings up in you, we want to hear it so that we can have this dialogue and kind of see where that takes us. 
Uh, and so that way, kind of regardless of how the co-working component of the project goes, there's this whole layer of value being created just around the conversations that happened and maybe recording that or, or, or taking notes on it and sharing that with other people. I have to imagine there are going to be a lot of other uh, churches and similar institutions that would be paying very close attention to that would get a lot of value out of that. Yeah, uh, I mean, you absolutely get it. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. And, and, and my focus, although I, I want to keep that in foresight with the, the ability to scale something, it, it all comes down to the ability to execute on one model, right? Um, starting there. Um, one thing that just comes to mind when you're talking is trying to blend in like two different uh, approaches to work. One is based on a wisdom tradition, right? Something that's passed down for millennials. And the other one is based on iteration, continuing changing and improving. And, um, and so like learning how to, you know, blend in those two, uh, you know, creates, creates a new possibility of, uh, of wisdom coming in with, with, you know, iteration and, um, and, 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 and kind of, uh, you know, again, hearing you say what you're saying is, is the expectations have to be soft expectations because in order for us to really truly continue to capture potential value, we have to continue to set new expectations. Um, we can't just start with the ones from day one and say those are the same as days, you know, six months. Um, but we're, it's a, it, we're on a learning curve here um, as there's not really a model uh, that's been, uh, you know, that we can fully look at. Um, I guess a couple of questions I'd have on that, um, Tony, is just, um, you know, other co-working spaces, if it, obviously not involved in a, in a church or religious institution, but um, when they go out and they, they, they want to create that type of culture that's not maybe even found at other co-working space in their market, um, you know, what, what does that process look like? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's interesting that you frame it that way, because when I got started in the co-working world, co-working itself was kind of the radical new thing. And so, you know, when you're talking 10 years ago, just the idea of people getting out of their house and working together in this new format was kind of radical. And so that process actually would be applicable to you now because you're kind of forging into that new territory. And I think that you're already way on the right track with this, which is really inviting people to wonder on this kind of a thing with you. Um, the invitation is really the core of what it is that makes a really great co-working community, the act of inviting people uh, and being in a, a space of wonder. So, you know, not just saying, this is what I'm gonna do uh, and, you know, buy it or don't, you know, sign up here, but to say, you know, I've got this idea, I really think it could be something important. Um, what do you think? You know, do you, does this register for you? Is this interesting? Good or bad, yes or no, up or down, just, you know, is there some, or you have a, re, a reaction and is that interesting? Do you want to share that? Um, and then inviting people to have that conversation. And what you end up doing is by creating that invitation and creating a space for conversation, um, you're letting people also express their own views on it uh, and um, letting people kind of create those cross connections between each other to, you know, see each other and see what their views are and then be able to connect around the fact that they have overlapping ideas or conflicting ideas that they want to discuss further. You know, you're kind of creating this fun primordial space for new relationships to be forming. Um, mm -hmm. just, just dialogue, mm -hmm. just having a space for um, discourse around perhaps a somewhat controversial topic is something that we don't really have much of these days. You know, uh, we do a heck of a lot of it online. You know, there's a whole lot of discourse happening on social media right now. It's not necessarily healthy. Um, you know, I would say, I would venture to say the vast, vast majority of that dialogue happening now is very, very unhealthy. Uh, and so mm -hmm. just creating a space for people to have a, a healthy, positive, constructive debate uh, or, or conversation around topics that are, you know, interesting to them. I think there's just so much untapped need for that. Uh, mm -hmm. in real life uh, that we can, you know, kind of form real life relationships with people and have these kinds of conversations. I, I feel like that's where you're going to have an amazing starting point. Uh, and y I can't imagine that there isn't uh, sufficient interest in what you're mm -hmm. talking about because, well, first of all, I mean, religion, there's going to be so much 
around that and, and the role of the church and society. We know that that's changing. We know that people and their relationship with faith and with, with spirituality is changing so drastically and people's relationship with work is changing and people's relationships with each other are changing because of technology and all of these other factors. Uh, and so there's just such a rich world of topics you could cover there between those different kind of subject matters. I feel like I'd, I'd want to just start by, by maybe, you know, so, you know, okay, so let, let's, uh, I'll put a button on that, which is, you know, let's do those gatherings around those topics. Now mm. we want to say, um, okay, you don't necessarily feel like you have the chops to necessarily moderate that kind of a conversation because it can definitely mm. get heated. Uh, you know, mm. you might have different people coming in. You're not really sure who's going to show up or what they're going to have to say. And it certainly could be uh, a volatile situation. So how do you kind of create um, some sense of safety and maybe find some way to bring out people who might be able to more effectively help you moderate this kind of thing. Uh, and so for that, I have an idea as well, mm -hmm. uh, which is to start with people that, you know, uh, you've already got some contacts at the church. I'm sure you've got other folks that you know in the community um, and start maybe without it being a public thing and without mm -hmm. even being formal thing to say, you know, in the easiest and simplest terms possible, you know, if you made a list right now of, you know, five to 10 people that you could invite to lunch and say, you know, Hey, I'm just getting some friends together to talk about this thing. Um, you know, some other people I've been talking to about similar stuff that I've been talking to you about, uh, would you be game? And if you can get, you know, five, six, seven of those people together to have a very, very informal conversation about it, you know, mm -hmm. then you get to curate the people who show up, you know, generally kind of what their deal is. And so you can kind of, mitigate the need for there to be professional moderation by by way of curating the audience uh for one mm -hmm. and then secondarily uh you know create kind of a very very safe circumstance for there's just to be this relationship building where you know maybe you cover some of these things maybe to a large extent it's just getting people into a room so that they can get to know each other um and what i found is in those early days so much can be accomplished just by getting people into the same room and having everyone introduce themselves. And that's pretty much all you can, you know, like if that's all you do and then you eat a meal together, uh, you've laid this incredible groundwork for what will become more substantial conversations down the line. Um, but at least establishing this kind of, you know, shared sense of everyone here knows each other. Everyone here is broken bread together. We've established some trust. Now, if you've got that five, six, seven people who are kind of, they know each other and they're a little bit on board with the idea a little bit more, then when you kind of maybe down the line, you're opening up the project where now you might have 10, 15, 20 people in the room and it's a more public uh, conversation, mm -hmm. you're not the only one there who is invested in this being a, a, a healthy and positive and productive project. You've got now, you know, those other people who, trust each other and are supporting each other in, in kind of working with you on this. Um, and that mitigates the, the risks around kind of opening up the project more. And even in that, you know, second or third meeting where you've got 10 or 15 or 20 people, even those don't have to be totally public. You can start with, you know, friends of friends of the initial people that you meet with. I'm seeing mm -hmm. you're nodding your head. Am I, am I vibing with you well so far here? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, that, that dissection makes it less, less, less daunting um, to, to go like that. And I can personally relate as I've had, um, you know, conversations around, uh, let's just say, bring up politics in this age. Uh, just this last week, and I had a reunion with some friends in Texas, and we're extremely politically different. But the conversation happened after, you know, three days of hunting and fishing and um, and just enjoying the, our humanity together. Um, and so, you know, like being able to, to share that, that common ground um, for so many days, and we, when we finally got to our differences, you, you, you were, we were, we're in this creative tension at that point where we couldn't just look each other in the eye and be like, you know, it, it, it just, I can't respect you, I can't respect that, right? It was, you had to kind of allow it to be, to whatever position someone else had to influence you um, before you just tried to control it. 
Um, and, and I, you know, when you're when talking about these things, I, I hear like this is a gentle process, but one that, that needs to happen in order to, um, to really create a place of creative tension, which I think is part of, of, of culture now that I think of it, right, is, is, is not this homo, um, like, genius, like, you know, place where everyone is exactly the same, but everyone can come in and, and be a little different, a little quirky, a little vulnerable in different places and, and feel, uh, like you said, have, still has an invitation at the table. Um, and, and, and I guess the last thing on that, there's something, I think, honestly, um, transcendent about just breaking bread or, or sharing a meal together, right? That we, we realize, you know, we're, we're all like, at the end of the day, it's like grown up babies that need to be fed and need to, you know, sleep and, 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 and we just enjoy, you know, the simple pleasures in life. And, and through that, like we can have maybe some conversations that we don't feel like we need to jump on grenades quite, quite quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that, like what you, you what you mentioned really helped just to lay out, uh, I think, a framework of, of moving forward a couple of steps going. Thanks. I'm glad that's helpful to you. And, uh, and I, I, the more that I think about that breaking bread, it really can't be overestimated the value of it. It's just it's in our culture. Right. It's been studied. Uh, sociologists have looked at it where, you know, humans are uncomfortable eating alone. Uh, and, you know, so so eating is a social experience. It's just, it's in our blood. It's in our nature. Uh, and it happens to be in this day and age, uh, a rare opportunity to get people away from their screens. Mm. And you know, we're in such a busy culture now. Um, our attention spans are, are just crazy right now. And, uh, and so, you know, but everybody still has to eat. And so creating that space to say, Hey, I know you're busy, but you still got to eat lunch. You know, it's mm. so they'll have a chance to kind of yeah. get people some FaceTime away from the screens. Uh, I know one event we did at the co-working space I ran in New York uh, that was just blew my mind. We, we did like a panini press lunch thing. And uh, so we had like, you know, a couple panini presses going and we kind of made this announcement like, hey, everybody come get lunch. Uh, but since it's a panini press, you can only make, you know, one or two at a time. And so we had mm. this huge line of like 30 people waiting for their food. And this is normally a space where even when you're at lunch, it's very easy to kind of go out for lunch and just grab it and bring it back to your desk or you order in or whatever. But because those people had to wait online, immediately everybody online just started talking to each other. Like people were introducing themselves to each other who had been working alongside each other in the same space for months and just hmm. didn't know each other. And so I realized that I accidentally stumbled on something really clever, which is make people wait online for a few minutes. Uh, for some, <laughs> and then they then they have to talk to each other because there's nothing else they can do. Um, but the way that the space erupted into this like social energy, just by mm -hmm. saying you know hey lunch is on you know and all of a sudden these people who are kind of you know on their computer focus are now up they're away from the screens and now they're talking and like the noise level just went through the roof and it was so so cool. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, breaking bread the value of that. Coming back to the general gist of, of what we're getting at, something you said uh, earlier in your response to me was, you know, making this less scary, making this smaller, easier to approach. This is kind of the core of everything that I want to do with how, uh, how, how we all approach building these co-working communities. Running a office space will throw so many challenges at you. There are so many things, especially if you're dealing with build out, uh, there's just, there's so many headaches. There's so many things that are challenging. So there's no reason to make this more challenging than necessary. If we can make certain parts of this easier, then let's absolutely do it. Uh, and, and part of, you know, part of why this is, is also better to start small is that it helps you to iterate more effectively. Mm. Uh, you know, if you start with a conversation of four or five people, it's very easy to make radical changes to your plan because you're, it's just a conversation over lunch. Uh, mm -hmm. and you don't even have, you don't have a website yet. You don't have a brand for it yet. You know, in that, in that kind of model, or even if you do, it's very easy to change it. Once you're further along in the process, it gets harder to make those radical changes. So you want to be able to gather Intel at every possible kind of small stage you can. Uh, and we want to incorporate that as much as we can into every part of the process. How can we iterate this? How can we take small steps and kind of use that to help inform the larger ones? So I think we've got a good action plan for you now as far as that's concerned. 
you know, starting with the super small invitation only kind of informal gathering. And then maybe you, maybe you kind of repeat that for a while, build a critical mass and then use that to kind of inform some kind of a next, next level up small medium gathering, which may or may not be public. And then, you know, use that to kind of eventually get you to the point where you have something that is truly public and, you know, kind of more involved in the process. Um, so mm -hmm. we're feeling good about that. Feeling great. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. All right. Let's see if we can apply the same thinking uh, to your conversation about technology platforms. I know we have just a little bit of time left, so we should be able to kind of do a quick little uh, overview about it. But uh, can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts and your questions around that? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the, the, this church uh, has about as much technology as a, a barn, um, you know, so you know, we got lights and we got running water. Um, but, uh, you know, so really where the technology conversation started was we have a unique asset here, which is we have a daycare, right? And, and when I actually talk to people about co-working, I've realized that I don't know another co-working space that has the ability of, of dropping off your kids in the morning and seeing them throughout the day and, and um, and so, that, you know, it brings up a whole unique, you know, um, just value add, right? But it also brings a huge liability of having, um, for lack of better wording, like uh, unknown adults coming into the premise, right? Um, there's just, you know, legality concerns. There's, you know, a lot of concerns around just day, uh, just children on um, using a portion of, of the premise. So um, I think the technology comes into consideration when we think of security, uh, it, it comes into when we think of just operations overall, um, you know, technology comes into uh, just uh, how, to, how to facilitate that with, um, you know, a, a pastoral staff that's not up to speed as well and, and show them the, the benefits of it too. Um, but we're really starting from square one, which is exciting. You know, we haven't made any big investments that need to be rethought. Um, and we can take, you know, some, a lot of suggestions on, you know, what we should use uh, going forward, but we definitely uh, love to see what people say about, um, you know, uh, just managing access to a facility um, and, uh, and, 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 and making it as painless as possible for, for, you know, the church as well as the community to use the space. Sorry, I have to unmute. Uh, yeah, understood. You know, for that, you've got a lot, especially with the childcare component, uh, obviously, you have a lot of uh, legal concerns to be kind of accounted for. Uh, are you are you involved in the child care side of it, or is that a totally separate thing? It, it's a, it's a, another member that goes to the church. It's his business. Um, uh, I'm not involved directly in it. No. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say because if you have to deal with it, then you know that's a whole other conversation. But <laughs> um, yeah, the software and the technology side of it is. It's a, it can be a very big kind of complex thing. Um, it's really hard to give direct recommendations to, you know, specific platforms or solutions, things like that, just because everyone's needs are radically different. And yours are no, no different from that concern. Uh, although it sounds like based on what you're describing that accounting for the possibility of having uh, really good access control uh, and maybe cameras, things like that, uh, you might have a greater need for that than maybe a typical co-working space just because you have this additional liability in mind. Um, so it might be that this guy who's running the daycare side of things, you know, talking to their council, uh, you know, and, and, and just assessing kind of what their liabilities and risks and insurance requirements, things like that are, um, mm -hmm. might be helpful just to get a lay of the land. And uh, certainly if you have access to legal counsel of some kind, whether, you know, someone you engage professionally or even just a friend in the community who's willing to offer up some pro bono help uh, always helps to get a little bit of additional boost there. Um, but I think once you have a better idea of what those needs are, then you can, you know, come to like my, you know, the group that you're a member of here, the organizers club and say, you know, these are the needs that I have. Does anyone else have a similar solution that they've used uh, and see what kind of responses you get? And, um, and then just use that as a starting point um, for narrowing down the different kinds of platforms you might want to be looking at. And then um, at that point, once you've got to kind of narrow down to the ones that you know cover the needs that you have, uh, you can look at, you know, 
just diving into each platform, learn a little bit about them, learn you know what their feature sets are. Uh, ultimately, there is no perfect platform, uh, and one of the things that gets people in trouble is that they keep trying to find one, uh, and they just it's never going to exist. So ultimately, what it comes back to is developing a, a business process. Um, when we ran our co-working space in New York, uh, it was before there were any software platforms for co-working spaces, and so we didn't have a choice. We had to kind of hack it together, just kind of using PayPal and Google Docs and you know manually created uh, documents and processes. But what we found was, as much as that was painful to us in some ways, and we were held back by by that in certain ways, we were able to get it down to kind of a system that worked consistently by documenting the process and just saying, you know, okay, when someone signs up, we get this trigger, right? They fill out a form or a payment is completed and there's a notification. And then these are the things we do. We take their email and their name, we put them in our membership list, we add them to our discussion group, we add them to our Slack channel, uh, you know, we put them on a calendar to remind them certain things, whatever. And so, you know, it was a, a relatively labor intensive process, but over time we were able to reduce that labor to, you know, a really quick kind of boom, boom, boom. These are the things you do. And then they're onboarded and, and you're good to go. Um, and so whatever platform you end up working with, ultimately you're going to have some kind of manual components to get the members integrated into your various systems. Uh, and so just documenting that process, revisiting it on a regular basis, making that really easy to train for, just getting all that kind of documented uh, is, is a big help. And what I'd advise is if you can, get that process started before you open the space. So if you can have some of the earliest members of your space who, you know, like people who they're on board, they're ready to go, maybe they've prepaid their first month membership or whatever, um, test them out, you know, have them walk through the whole sign up process uh, and see where it breaks, see where they run into problems with, you know, email notifications, or whatever it is, uh, and, you know, have it so that by the time you really got the space publicly open, you've been able to iron out a lot of those bugs uh, and identify any challenges and, you know, make any big changes that you need to make uh, so that when you maybe have a lot of people coming through for the first time, you've already kind of, you know, ironed those things out. What you want to do is, uh, you know, I had this video recently about the red zone, that time, like right before you open, right after you open. That's when you want the least headaches possible because there's always going to be unexpected stuff. So the more you can kind of iron that out in the beginning, the better. Um, I realize I'm not giving you a direct answer to your question, but I, am I kind of help, helping point you in the right direction at least? Yeah, no, and I, I think you actually are. I think the two big points is first, um, you need to start the business process and document it. Right. And just go through and, and go through like that tedious, you know, exercise of getting a bunch of input, you know, from all the stakeholders of the space and continuing to you know, do that well in advance of opening up the space. And then from looking at that, being like, well, what would help facilitate this? You know, what would help to automate this? You know, are, are there solutions to this? And, and posing those questions to the group at large, as that's the reason we're part of this group is there's a, a body of knowledge that continues to develop and, and, and know specific things. Um, so I think, I think that's, you know, the, you know, the really helpful part, um, of, of not just giving a quick answer, like look at these three technologies. Um, but, uh, I think going back to just the, the, the process and, and, uh, documenting it and, and doing it, uh, mindful of, of the timeline of, of when you start and, um, is what's really helpful. Cool. Yeah. I'm excited to, to kind of see how that goes for you and, you know, obviously, once you start getting into the specifics of which platform or, or you know, how to address certain needs, uh, then, you know, come to the discussion group and we'll see what other people are using and what they'll recommend or what they'll recommend not to use. And, uh, you know, we can kind of iron out some of the details uh, as you go from there. That sounds great. I'm looking forward to it. Cool. Uh, Brandon, we're making excellent time. Uh, do you have any other kind of burning questions or, or things that are on your mind right now as you're kind of uh, approaching next steps for you? Uh, yeah, I guess um, I, I guess the next step would just be, you know, actually legal, uh, right? Um, and this is just me being honest about what I just don't know, I don't have a background in, and, and how to incorporate legal 
and I can be specific to our, you know, our, our situation, which I think is unique and I wouldn't expect like a, a direct <laughs> solution, but um, moreover, just, you know, how do you see legal coming into um, like as a needed asset with co-working uh, specifically for me, you know, other than just the co-working general operations um, is, uh, you know, we have specific zoning issues that we have to kind of work through um, as a church it's typically looked at as a place of, uh, um, of not office space. Um, and so we had to look more into our, our conditional use permit and the permitting that we had received. And we're fortunate to be around here long enough, um, over 50 years that we got grandfathered in um, to be able to have a much more um, broad scope of, of what we could do here. Um, if we were a new church, we'd have to, you know, really quickly go to the city and ask for permission to do anything other than pretty much Sunday mornings. But um, we've been able to, you know, move, you know, forward uh, by just going to the city and pulling up our, our original permitting and, and seeing what the language was. Um, but beyond that, like, I'm curious the advice on how just incorporating legal prudently from the get go before you, you come up to, you know, some pitfalls that are common. That's an awesome question, and I think that you framed it in a good way. And really what it comes back to, this is another reason why having that kind of informal lunch meeting is so valuable, because if you've got five or six other people you already know, you've kind of been talking to about it, you can put this on your list of questions to ask. You know, hey, does anybody here know a lawyer who would know something about this? Um, and regardless of that, you're working with a church, and the, an established church, that means that you've already got an existing community to build off of. This is critical for anybody building a co-working space. You want to find other existing communities that you can use as you know, starting points to build your own community. Uh, you've got one big one already that's partnered with you. And so I have to imagine within that network of the hundreds or thousands of people in that church community, there's either you know, the, the perfect kind of person who can help you in that community or a spouse of one of those people or a friend of a friend you know the, the the degrees of kevin bacon once you get one degree out from that direct church community um there's got to be somebody there who'd be able to give you pro bono work ideally uh or you know discounted work or advice as to who to talk to you know something to really make that process go easier uh, when we were in new york we had a guy in our community who was a startup lawyer Roman Fickman, he was amazing, donated his services to us at a time when we had no money. And you know what? When we had startups that wanted advice, we sent them to him. And so it really was, you know, it wasn't just charity for him. It was a smart business move because he knew he was offering the services to someone who would ultimately be sending potential clients back to him. So, um, you know, try to find that person in your community minimize the cost as much as possible, but uh, definitely do find some way, one way or another, uh, to get some professional legal guidance uh, for what you're doing. You know, with a lot of businesses these days, you don't need legal counsel. You know, if you wanna start an Etsy store, if you wanna build a website and you know, just offer some consulting services online, you probably don't really need to consult professional legal counsel to get, get up and running and do business, uh, although it certainly could be helpful but for something like this, we have a physical space uh, and with these layers of the church and the daycare, um, you know, you do have real exposure to potential legal liability, uh, especially around people being injured, but all kinds of other things as well. So, um, you know, as much as I always try to find the most lightweight way to do things, uh, you know, I really do recommend getting at least some lightweight guidance from some professional legal counsel. And you should really be able to find that within your community uh, if you're able to put that call out. Um, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And, and as we're talking, a person comes up to mind right away. So, um, you know, I think, I think I know the individual and, and I also remember, uh, some of the material that you, you provided. One of them was like a, a membership agreement, right. Um, that I think it you know, be helpful to kind of look through and, and, and think through, um, we're fortunate I don't have a lease to worry about, but I think that's probably one thing that when I worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, just the ability to read through a lease and understand how to negotiate that was critical. And, and I always recommend getting uh, legal counsel um, on, on, on you know, lease negotiations. Um, but uh, 
you know, other than that, I think I'd just go to a lawyer and ask him, you know, what are things that I need to consider that I just don't have on the agenda right now? And I'd, I'd also go to the group um, and, you know, follow up this conversation with an email and say, what are, you know, what are the considerations that, you know, you know uh, a startup co-working space needs to take in consideration um, before they get into like a potential legal pitfall um, that could be a, avoided through, you know, certain kind of documentation up front and, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think you're off to a great start. I feel like you've got lots of homework. So uh, I imagine you're going to be real busy the next couple of weeks. But um, please let us know how it goes. Uh, keep us posted on your progress. Once you've made a little bit of headway on all of these things, I'm sure you're going to have a lot more, uh, a lot more to share and a lot more questions. So uh, I'm really excited for you. I'm excited to see where this goes and looking forward to seeing on the other end uh, what you're able to stir up and Hopefully we're, we're able to, um, you know, help this to become something that inspires other people to rethink, you know, how they might be able to use their uh, church spaces and, and similar institutions. So um, yep. keep up the great work. I'm, I'm excited for you. Awesome, Tony. And thanks for the opportunity just to share and, and to receive and um, be a part of this group. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Brandon. All right, man. Take care.